Hello, everyone. Welcome to our inaugural episode of DEI Unmasked, Conversations That Bridge. We are live today. And before we dive in today's episode, we'd like to make it clear that the views and opinions that we are going to express on this podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily reflect the views of any organization, company, or entity with which we may be associated. So our discussions are going to be personal and they're really meant for entertainment and informative purposes only. Now, have you ever wondered what happens behind the scenes when certified DEI professionals get together and start chatting? Well, here is your opportunity um, to sit, to share, to listen with all of us as we open up and start to remove the mask of calm that most DEI practitioners and consultants are expected to wear in exchange for heartfelt, humorous, and earnest conversations about the current state of the DEI space. Now, during this live today, if you would like to utilize closed captions, we encourage you to do so. To enable closed captioning, simply navigate to the settings on your viewing platform. Additionally, we value your participation and would love to stay connected. In the chat, you'll find a form where you can share your contact information. By doing so, you'll receive timely alerts for our upcoming live sessions. We are so eager to involve each of you in shaping our future discussions. So please feel free to use this form to share any questions or topic suggestions you'd like us to explore in our upcoming episodes. DEI Unmasked is not just a podcast. It's really an invitation to peel back those layers, reveal the depth, and engage in a transformative dialogue. So let's take some time and let's unmask together. I will be your host today. My name is Tanasha Lawcock, and I'm going to be sharing some information with all of you. We are each going to go through, we'll do some personal introductions so you can get to know a bit about each of us. And then we'll go through and each of us will talk a bit about what brought us into the DEI sphere and why we are so passionate about this work. So once again, my name is Tanasha Lawcock. As you can see, I am sitting against a tan background, and you can see behind me that I have a book from one of my favorite TV shows, Psych. You can also see I have a colored canvas above my head with a very colorful mid-century modern bird. You can just see the bottom of half, half of that. And then here over my other shoulder, there is an eggplant colored canvas um, that is from another one of my favorite shows, the TV show Pose. And fun fact, it's just out of camera shot, but that canvas was actually autographed by the incomparable Billy Porter when I met him earlier this year. So beautiful piece, something that I love. Now, as I get into my introduction, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that my home sits on the traditional territory of the Hohokam people. My pronouns are she, her. I am a black, queer, pansexual, cisgender woman, I am neurodivergent, and have a couple of invisible disabilities. I'm originally from Illinois, but I have resided here in sunny Phoenix, Arizona, my goodness, for almost three decades now. I live with my amazing spouse of the last 12 years and my tiny little dog, Peyton, named after Peyton Manning, of course. Um, we are empty nesters. Yay! So I have two adult sons who are just my favorite people on this earth, and they are both now in their mid to late 20s. My oldest son actually has several disabilities that date back to his time as a preemie in the NICU. And so many of the lessons that I have learned from being his mom and learning to advocate for him over the last almost 30 years, as well as advocating for myself, uh, definitely show up quite a bit in my work. And that's one of those things that I think about regularly, the importance of lived experience. Uh, it's so different from an abstract concept. And so I always remind myself to remember uh, that the value of lived experience is so important and imperative in the DEI space. My undergraduate education is in communication. I also have a dual postgraduate education in both general psychology and industrial and organizational psychology. 
So I love being able to marry those two sides, understanding the development of the individual along with the development of an organization. Psychology is a lifelong passion for me. And I started reading about psychology when I was only six years old. So I'm a total psych nerd and proud of it. Uh, I also belong to Psy Chi and Alpha Chi, uh, two prestigious academic honor societies. Career-wise, I have almost 14 years of leadership experience and over 12 years of HR experience. I've worked in roles ranging from customer service supervisor to HR director to DEI and B business partner. I walked away from corporate America last year to start my own DEI consultancy, which is Be the Mindset Change. And I am a public speaker. I really specialize in the facilitation of growth mindset training and development of a growth mindset as a vital tool to mitigate bias and decision making as part of my DEI work. So I really want to make sure that the DEI work I do with my clients is transformative as opposed to performative. So that's a little bit about me. I am now going to turn it over to our next co-host, Crystal. So Crystal, please tell us a bit about yourself. Hi, everyone. My name is Crystal Edney, and my pronouns are she and her. I'm currently sitting in my virtual office with uh, my favorite color teal in the background, the accent pillows. I am an African-American cisgender female, and I'm currently wearing um, waist length box braids. I traditionally have an insurance background and I've been doing DEI work for the past um, over 20 years, probably closer to 23 years. I possess a master's degree in business administration as well as marketing, um, a dual, ba dual bachelor's deg degree in marketing and management information systems, as well as a um, master's in MBAs I've just previously mentioned. Uh, as far as land acknowledgments, acknowledgments, I currently am residing in the traditional territory of the Sala Gawiti Yi region of South Carolina, or um, better known as the East Cherokee region of South Carolina, which is Irmo, South Carolina. I started doing DEI work um, early in my career, and I've, I've it just taken a, a love to it, even though I've traditionally been doing the insurance work alongside DEI work. Um, in my spare time, I love to travel internationally. I love diving into great books. I love food, namely tacos. <laughs> I love mis visiting museums um, throughout the world. So pretty much anywhere I go, whether it's a small town or in a pocket of a different part of the world, I'll be checking out the museums wherever I go. Uh, I'm a plant mom and I'm a fashion fanatic and I've recently started my own style and, and image consulting business. So that's pretty exciting. Um, rest is resistance is a current mantra of mine. I'm currently trying to embrace this, this um, mantra, but it's a little difficult with all of the going ons of life because everybody knows that life is lifing. <laughs> so I'm, I'm currently trying to embrace the whole rest is resistance, thought, um, and mind frame mindset. And I'm currently toying with the idea of becoming an expat in the near future. So more to come on that. And with that, I want to turn it over to my co-host, Courtney. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much, Crystal. So hi, everyone. My name is Courtney Hutton. My pronouns are she, her. And I am a brown skinned cisgender black woman of moderate height. And I'm currently rocking faux locks right now, <laughs> faux lock crochets. Um, though this could change, I change my hair so much. I love switching up my look. Um, professionally, I am a certified people and culture professional, and my expertise lies in talent acquisition. I do have a background in business development and HR operations as well. Um, I've been in HR now for about four years, so I recently transitioned to this space. I'm also navigating the world of academia as a master's student. I'm pursuing my MBA and my human resource management degree. 
And if you know me, you know I love spending time with my family, my chosen family, my partner, and I really love planning and organization and occasionally a fancy beverage. <laughs> Um, but now I will quickly want to mention that I am gathered on the traditional lands of the Aka, uh, Kappa peoples, um, the Ako Kosi, and the Kuran Kuwa peoples, just to name a few. And collectively, as a podcast, our voices, we recognize and respect the enduring connection to this territory, and we express our gratitude for the opportunity to live, learn, and work on the ancestral lands. So in the, in the spirit of rec reconciliation, um, we want to just take time to reflect on the past and present contributions of indigenous people and strive to be more mindful of our collective responsibility to honor and protect this land. So with that, I will pass the conversation over now to my co-host, Greta Lax. Thank you, Courtney. Hello everyone, I am Greta. I use she, her pronouns. I am a white woman with shoulder length, blonde hair, red glasses, um, uh, wearing a white uh, shirt with black polka dots and behind me are um, bookcases and shelves with some of my favorite things. Um, so I am uh, born and raised in Wisconsin though I spent uh, most of the last 20 years in the state of Ohio in the Akron area, um, but I'm very happy to be home um, here where we are. I'm living on the land that has been cared for uh, by the Menominee, the Oneida, the Missouri, the Sioux, Ho-Chunk, Miami, Potawatomi, and Ojibwe people before they were forced from these lands. Um, today, I'm nearest to and continue to learn from the Oneida Nation. Um, here in Wisconsin, we have 11 federally recognized tribes, and we also have um, the Brothertown tribe that is still uh, fighting for federal recognition at this time. So I am a cisgender straight white woman with uh, neurodivergence and multiple um, less apparent disabilities. Uh, I'm a first gen college student who comes from a low income rural area. Um, my education and my background is actually industrial organizational psychology. I started off uh, with my bachelor's in psych. I've always been interested in people and human behavior. Um, I worked for a few years. Um, that's actually an understatement. Actually, I've, I've been working since I was 13 years old, <laughs> before I could hold a work permit. And it was usually two, three jobs at a time. Um, so I've seen a lot of really terrible work environments over my time. So between my interest in people um, and some of the work experiences I've had, I've always wanted to go back and try to be in a position where I could help, uh, you know, to put myself in a position to be able to contribute uh, in different ways. So went back to school, um, got my master's in IO. I'm actually also all but dissertation um, in my uh, PhD level program for IO Psych. I'm a certified diversity professional, certified executive coach, a couple of other things in there. Um, I'm a facilitator, a trained facilitator as well in a couple of different models. But really, I came to this work, um, just my curiosity about people um, and my curiosity about both the similarities and the differences between us. It started um, as a kid. We didn't get to travel much for where I was, but I did get to spend a couple summers with family, um, one in Colorado or part of it and one in California. And I could see that even amongst family, right? And but being in very different regions, how very different life was, right? How very different it was within the family um, as well as in the the region, right? The geographic region. And then as a for, uh, as a senior in high school, I spent a year as a foreign exchange student. Uh, as a 16 year old, I went to Brazil. I did not speak the language. I spoke Spanish uh, and I had to learn Portuguese very, very quickly. Um, and all of those experiences just added up to, uh, to kind of, I guess, where I landed today. So, um, 
the my most recent position, I think, before right now I'm a coach, consultant, and facilitator. I work for myself. My most recent was working in Akron. I worked at the university for a federally funded program. I probably spent most of my time in community working on social determinants of health and health equity um, and education. So mentoring the next generation of students into creating a more diverse pipeline of students into careers in healthcare. Um, and helping people understand the what's behind health disparities, uh, social determinants, and helping to address them from individual to policy levels. That's kind of how I got here today. Um, and yeah, that's more than enough about me. I am going to pass the mic, Leandra. We would love to hear from you. Yay. Hi, y'all. Um, what a marvelous group. I mean, I'm a little biased because we've been planning this for a while, but like, can I hype my people for a moment? Oh my gosh. All right, y'all. Hello. I am Leandra Stanley. I use she, they pronouns. I'm a light-skinned biracial black woman with a round face and big natural curly brown hair pulled up atop my head. Um, and I am wearing black a black shirt and black glasses, as well as I have a uh, colorful floral tattoos on my shoulders that are exposed uh, this time around. And I am sitting in front of a background that has a ton of wonderful DEI books. So if ever you need a DEI recommendation, I've got many for you, as well as my bookshelf has a bunch of plushies of a uh, of variety of flavors, uh, food plushies, animal plushies, and the like. Um, but about me, I was born and raised in Portland, Oregon, where I still reside with my partner and my cat, Nala. Um, Portland rests on the traditional village sites of the Multnomah, Wasco, Cowlitz, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapuya, Malala, and many other tribes who made their homes among the along the Columbia River and Willamette Rivers. I personally studied American Ethnic Studies and Sociology in undergrad, and that was the only degree that I got. I did not uh, further seek um, more ac higher level academia as I went undiagnosed as a neurodivergent person for many years and didn't know until last year that I was rocking with ADHD and autism. And so that has changed the way that I am learning now and the way that I have regarded my entire education and a lot of my experience as a queer, gender queer, black, disabled, neurodivergent person has really inspired me to get into DEI a little bit selfishly for myself because I want to understand why I'm experiencing the world the way I do, but also why other people like me are experiencing a variety of disadvantages or just different experiences than other folks. And so, so much of my DEI experience isn't in the professional world, but in the trying to understand people, human nuance, trying to figure out like what policies and what laws are in place that result in the disadvantage of people in ways that I, that didn't make sense to me as someone that wants good for as many people as possible. Um, but ultimately a couple years ago, um, at almost two years now, I got into my first role as a director of diversity and inclusion at a big tech company and it's an inaugural role so it has been uh, building a program from the the ground up and it has been challenging in many ways um, but also i've grown in many ways as well and i've built a really delightful network that's kind of gotten me here in this room with y'all um and so that i think that's what i've got to say about myself right now um oh i love dogs I love houseplants as well. Um, I love Pose and Billy Porter. I didn't know about the Billy Porter situation and Tanasha's background, so I'm a little bit jealous here. So gonna put those feelings out there for the live. Um, but I'm really glad to be here with y'all. I am super excited to talk with this group and for the rest of the audience that's here as well. And I am going to throw it back to Tanasha to take us to our next phase. Thanks, y'all. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much all four of you for sharing your stories. One of the things that I always appreciate about this group is how we've come from, you know, all of these different walks of life. And just so our audience knows, we actually met during a uh, DEI certification program. And I took the program because Leandra recommended it and I followed her on Facebook. And I just so happened to be in a class with Greta and Courtney and Crystal. And so we all connected. And then I said, 
Leandra would probably love this. Let me reach out. And we brought Leandra in. And now you have all of us sitting here today after conversations that we've been having pretty much this whole year. We would connect each month. And, and one of us just had the idea and said, you know, I feel like we should be sharing these conversations with other people. And so DEI Unmasked was born uh, at that time. And so you could see where we come from all these different places, but where we're just connected uh, by our absolute and unending passion for DEI work. So now that we've all um, introduced ourselves and everyone's gotten to know a little bit about us, now we are going to segue into talking about the reasons that we came into this work. And some of us mentioned it a bit in our introductions. And now we're each going to take a moment or two and just give you all a little bit more detail about how we came to be under this DEI umbrella. Uh, for me, I am one of those people, I always say I stay learning, like I'm always reading. I am reading uh, Black AF history right now. I am reading Decentering uh, Whiteness in the Workplace. And I am reading um, a book for Black women in entrepreneurship. And so I am just always learning, committed to that, and experiences that I have had as a black woman in corporate America and just a black woman in society, when I started getting into HR, I really decided to take advantage of that. And so I have always worked a bit in the vein of DEI, even when it wasn't specifically my job title, I have always looked at things in my organizations like tenure rates and are there differences across racial lines that we see? Do we have employees who may be queer? Are they comfortable being out at work? Um, I've always considered those things. And then, of course, having my own disabilities and, and having a son who has so many disabilities, who, who will quite literally be a child um, for the rest of his life, it really shined a light for me on those areas of need that people have. And it's one of those things where you don't know what you don't know. And so I deal a lot with lived experience and learning from people who may have areas of need that I do not have so I can understand how to best serve them. So I like to approach DEI work with a very simple mindset. And I talk about this when I do public speaking events and also with my clients, the importance of giving ourselves grace, space and room to grow because one of the things that I have seen firsthand and something that just inspires me to try to leave this world a somewhat better place, you know, for my children and for everyone else's children, um, it's just the thought of being kind to ourselves, because I feel like when we are kind to ourselves, we, we can extend kindness to others. Whenever I wind up in a situation where someone treats me as less than, my immediate thought is, I wonder what's going on in their mind that they would treat another person that way. I, I like to say that people who are in a healthy place with themselves will engage with others in a healthy way. And so I really focus on trying to build that um, in my work. And it really just inspires me and drives me. And like I said, leaving this world a better place in any small way that I possibly can. Um, just for others and, and for my kiddos. And I, I just want to feel like I'm making a positive and helpful difference for everybody. Like it's that concept of seeing past the tip of your own nose. I want to see everybody happy. Everybody should get to thrive. Everyone should feel worthwhile. I want that for everyone. And so I love being able to make any contributions to that. So that's a little bit about me and kind of how I came into this 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 whole swirl of DEI with everything that's going on. And now I'm going to turn it over to my co-host, Courtney. So Courtney is going to tell us a bit about what inspired her to get involved in DEI. So Courtney. Great. Thank you, Tanasha. So similar to Tanasha, my commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, it's not only professional, but it's also deeply personal. So I realized that I've always had a string of advocacy work throughout my career, although I didn't know it. 
um, while attending a DEI training at one organization, I realized that there is immense joy. I have immense joy in working with the interpersonal aspects of my role and my life. And I wanted to take on more projects that work around um, inclusive efforts and just helping the organization be um, better in that way. So that led me to realize that I wanted to pivot my career towards human resources so I could amplify and champion those unheard voices within the workplace. And at its core, my involvement in DEI really does stem from a profound conviction that there is significance in everyone's voice. And so similar to our decision to launch a podcast, everyone on this call really does believe that there is influence in one voice and together we can evoke change. So we truly look forward to having you all on this transformative journey with us as we continue to have these conversations. I know my commitment um, in witnessing the transformative impact of inclusive environments truly fueled my commitment even more to moving this work forward. And that really does involve dismantling barriers that hinder progress and constructing bridges that foster our universal connection. And we can't do that alone. We have to work together. So with that said, again, as Leandra mentioned, I am immensely grateful to work with this group of people to work on projects that are near and dear to our hearts. So I will pass now uh, the baton over to my co-host, Leandra. Thanks, Courtney. Um, so I mentioned a little bit about what got me into DEI in my intro, but I was thinking a little bit about this prompt when we were preparing for this. And so much of me getting into DEI was really about uh, when I was young, wanting to be liked, which transformed into wanting to make people feel safe and knowing that like, there's something that feels so good about knowing that I'm a safe person, a non-judgmental person where people feel, you know, safe with being whoever they are, wearing whatever they want, telling me their secrets, whatever that manifests as. And then I started thinking like, I can't be the only safe person for people. That's a lot of mo emotional labor, first of all, but also it's so important to have other spaces where people feel safe to be themselves. And I didn't really know that that was like a profession that you could have. So I spent my career doing a lot of random stuff from being in the legal department to doing random staffing and like employee record stuff in a room all by myself with a bunch of files to doing hospitality work and working as like a server and a front desk person at a hotel. I didn't really know what my calling was, but I still felt so drawn to creating spaces outside of work where people felt comfortable that I finally realized that there might be a job in this. And, and since my social activism really aligned with wanting people to have equitable access to things that feel like everyone should, like healthcare and housing and food. Um, but we are out here still fighting for people to have equal access for that. And realizing that the passion that I had for my personal sense of creating safe spaces and my social activist, like pro proclivity to creating safe spaces and wanting people to live safer lives um, or having safer access to things. I found that like DEI is something that can help other people create policies and create change that is going to create bigger safety in a systemic way that isn't just me in my living room creating a safe space. And so what started out is like, I want everyone to like me and then I want everyone to like each other turned out into like, I want everyone to have access to the things that they need to thrive, regardless of how well we get along with each other, because everybody getting along is not as possible as I wished it was in my early 20s when I first started doing this work. And so it's been really powerful to be a lifelong learner and to experience the learning curve of knowing that not everyone's going to like me, not everyone's going to be picking up what I'm putting down, but knowing that there are so many people who are trying to do the work both on themselves and on these systems that we're trying to dismantle. And that's what's made it really powerful to step into a role in DEI that feels so daunting and feels like such a fresh start when I'm trying to grow a big giant tree and I'm just a little seedling. But it's been really interesting to learn more about the systemic ways that we can get involved in that there are so many ways to do DEI work that aren't just like being out in the streets while it is important work. There are other things that we can be doing and things that people who literally can't be on the streets with my disabled body like myself like there are ways that I can contribute and every voice does matter. Um, and it's really 
wonderful to be heard, um, having lived a life where I was not heard as often as I think I should have been, um, especially in Portland, the whitest big U.S. city um, in, in our country. Um, it was a really interesting upbringing, and it's wonderful to finally find my voice, even though it took a lot of uh, kind of bumping around aimlessly for a while to figure out myself personally and in my career. Um, and now I'm going to pass it to Greta, now that I've been jibber-jabbering a little bit. Greta, take it on. <laughs> Thank you, Leandra. Gosh. Um, so I, I, too, also kind of touched a little bit on uh, what brought me to this work. Um, but I feel like I've never not been on this trajectory um, in a lot of ways. Um, like like some of you said, and like Leander said, a lot of it was early on, you know, just in a lot of ways, I felt very disconnected from people, the people that I felt like I should be connected to. And I've never quite understood that. Um, still figuring that out uh, to some extent. Um, and at the same token, uh, my parents, even though, you know, we didn't have much and there were a lot of struggles in my family. My dad was a Vietnam vet. Um, and it was one of the guys that came back that never really came back um, in a lot of ways, uh, undiagnosed, untreated PTSD, those kinds of things. Um, and a lot of the other things that uh, a lot of those vets brought back with them. So even, even so with the struggles that we faced, my family was always engaged in community um, and finding ways to participate and be involved and engage, you know, so um, so I learned that early on, you know, um, even in that teeny tiny little town, I'm going to tell you my graduating class, like for my whole county was maybe a hundred. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I, I come from one of those, yeah. One of those places in the, in the North woods. Um, and, and getting out, you know, a lot of what I did along the way was to build my resume so that I could get out of that teeny little town. And I'm not going to lie, as much as I love it and going back to visit, um, that was my goal at the time. And that's how I ended up in Brazil my senior year, um, which was the hard, probably one of the hardest and also one of the most formative experiences of my life. Um, and from there, it just continued. Like I said, you know, coming back, um, getting a degree in psych because I was interested in human behavior. I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do with that. So I just kept working because that's what I've been doing for most of my life. Just kept working and, and, and kept seeing where there were issues, where there were problems, where people were not taking care of their people. Organizations were not taking care of their people. Managers were not taking care of their people in a lot of different ways and for a lot of different reasons. And I wanted to be part of that solution. So from taking uh, from taking that and going back and adding in my interest in culture, um, you know, I've just continued to, uh, Tanasha talked about reading all the time. I, I used to read voraciously. It's a little harder for my brain right now. I do a little bit more listening than reading, um, but you know, continuing to try and and learn and grow and get out there and connect with people, right? Connect with people who have very different lived experiences from mine um, and continue to uh, learn ways to help other people develop that same skill set to be able to do that as well so that we can figure out where we are, where our strengths you know, where are our strengths for where we're at in terms of our capacity to navigate and manage the differences that exist between us, right? Because there are so many people from, from completely denying that differences, that those differences exist to, you know, trying to minimize those differences and focus only on the similarities, right? And then we lose that huge component, right? We, we lose the capacity to better understand people for who they are when we only focus on the similarities between us and then helping people navigate that pathway. So, and I've done that a lot of different ways over the years, um, but, you know, just kind of formalized it, um, you know, kind of put out my own shingle in the last two and a half years, but that was also part of my move home. Um, part of my move back to Wisconsin, which, wow, that was a whole, that's been a whole thing being away for, and I thought, you know, being in Brazil and being away for one year and coming back, that was a reverse culture shock being away from my home. 
for 19 years and coming back. Like I'm totally different, right? My lens is totally different. I was really blessed with some incredible experiences in Akron. I got to work um, side by side, day in and out with communities that had totally different lived experiences for me. And I will, you know, um, I say I learned as much in that time uh, as, as I did in grad school in any of my time in grad school, if not more about the ways that we need to keep learning and doing better. Um, definitely learned a lot about humility, uh, to add to that curiosity. Um, thankfully I had, had people who were willing to, to have some of those conversations with the nice white lady <clears throat> who needed to have some of those conversations. Uh, but I love, I, I love, I love when you're able to have that conversation with someone that you think might not be interested in connecting, right? That you think might not be that ready, that they're to, that want to connect across those differences. When you can tap into where their curiosity lies, where you can tap into where their interests are, and suddenly, right, you've opened, even if it's just a crack, you've opened a crack in that door that, that, that creates that possibility. And it's not everybody and it's not every time, but man, when that happens, when you can do that, you're creating possibility, not just for that person, but for everybody around them, right? Um, so that that is what keeps bringing me back to this work, even when, even when, right? Those days. Um, yeah. Whether that's the days of being an entrepreneur where you don't actually get to do the work that you want to do because you're doing all the stuff in the background or just the hard days in this work when things aren't going the way that you want them to. Um, just really grateful for the opportunity for those small moments and for, oh, for people like this group. Oh, that keep me, oh, man make it so that I can breathe, uh, right? Uh, on the On the days it feels sometimes like you can't. Um, just grateful for the opportunity to keep, keep doing this work and keep trying to move that needle forward. Uh, Crystal, <laughs> I think you're next. Thank you, Greta. I appreciate that. Um, and what you, a lot of what you said also echoes in my work as well, but I'll, I'll be touching on that as well. I'll have to say that my original, motivation for wanting to do DEI work started out as one thing, but it has now evolved into um, something different. I originally wanted to do DEI work uh, early in my career because I realized as a Black professional in the insurance industry, I looked around and I didn't see anybody that looked like me. Um, I mean, the, the differences were profound. I was a lot of times the only black person in the room, the only black person in the boardroom, the only black person doing presentations, not even, you know, another person of color in the room. And so I saw an opportunity where the company I was at at the time had a diversity, equity and inclusion committee and I joined and I said, you know, this would be a great way to um, educate other BIPOC people basically about the insurance industry. A lot of the reasons why a lot of people don't gravitate towards insurance is because they don't know what insurance, what you can do in insurance space. They don't realize there's a need for medical professionals, legal professionals, um, you know, people who have a um, criminal justice background. Like they don't realize there's a need for actuarial people, people who are great with math and science. And so I think that there was really um, a need for people to go out into spaces like HBCUs or community events and talk about the insurance industry and that you can have a viable career uh, within the insurance space. And so that's exactly what I did. I was um, going out to HBCU uh, homecoming games and rival games and just basically talking about my experience within the insurance industry and lots of students would come up to me and want to know more they would want to connect with me and they would want me to connect them with you know someone in underwriting or someone in hr like they just it was sparking these curiosities and i really got a lot of pleasure from it um, so I was always the one that was, you know, going out to the games, you know, going and trying to recruit 
um, students that were graduating soon. It was just something about it that just really fed me in a way that my actual job did not. And so I did that and did that for years and continued to do it, continued to serve uh, on DEI committees throughout the years, throughout different organizations that I was working for. And I would definitely have to say probably within the last five years or so, for me, it's more about sparking conversations and the curiosity behind getting to know other people that aren't like me, getting hearing their stories, finding out what their struggles are, finding out what, you know, works well for them, what doesn't work well, what are some barriers? Like I've I've really thoroughly enjoyed just the act of having conversations with people to exchange stories about not only my my journey, but hearing about their journeys. And it's just really, really, again, fed me in a way that my day-to-day role did not feed me. Um, by nature, I love to help people. And in the particular roles that I've had within the insurance industry, I didn't really feel that, that connection of I'm actually helping somebody every day. And I feel like that, that was a void that I really needed to fill. And so, you know, currently I still sit on DEI boards and I'll have conversations with executives. You know, they'll want to ask a question about why are, you know, African Americans not particularly interested in our company. And I can have those real and honest conversations with them and to give them not only insight, but to also give them some tools to maybe kind of think about things differently, think about approaches differently. And I've really enjoyed those conversations. I would say for the most part, you know, they've been pretty receptive um, in them hearing what I I have to say about um, my observations. I do a lot of reading as well, Um, books, journals, articles, it doesn't matter. I am just kind of slightly obsessed with um, learning more about um, the many facets of DEI work. And so, um, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much what drives me today. I love it. I continue. I wish I could do it in a more formal capacity, but even if I, I, that's not in the cards for me, or if I can't, I I still would definitely continue to do it in addition to whatever my job, my daily job and duties are um, with whatever organization. But yeah, so I would definitely have to say it evolved. It has evolved into sparking those conversations, me wanting to learn more about other people and then wanting to share my story openly with um, those that I work with on a day-to-day basis. Um, so that's pretty much it. in as far as why I'm inspired to do this work and I will turn things back over to Tanasha. All right. Thank you, Crystal. Thank you all so much for sharing that because I think when we tell our stories and we talk about why this work is so important, you just see this common thread of five people who have come into this space who care on a degree that's to a level that's almost stifling sometimes. Um, But I loved one of the things that I noticed that just really touched me is as we're each talking, you can see each one of us going to that part of our screen, you know, where we're watching the other person talking and you could just, it was palpable. You could just see like the admiration that we all have for each other and the respect we all have for one another and our journeys. And that is just one of those things that just always, always touches my heart because this is a a group of such tremendous individuals and knowing everything that I have learned from each of you and the time that I have known the four of you, I just get so excited when I think about us inviting others into these conversations that we've just really been having on our own for almost a year now. Like, can you believe that? I can't believe it's been almost a year. And so I, I'm looking like looking through some of the comments and people talking about how unique our stories are um, and insightful and inspiring. And and you see that that thread of trying to overcome, you know, there are layers of hardship, like there are layers of privilege and you can just see interwoven through all of this, the things that we've each had to go through to bring us to this place. 
where we just really have this ultimate caring about the world around us and how we can make those positive contributions. Like it's so hard. Sometimes it feels like, you know, looking for that needle in a haystack because you just want to make a positive difference. You just want to see some results. You just want to see it get a little bit easier. And so one of the things that I know that this group will do for any of our viewers, as we've done for one another, is to give that feeling of hope, you know, that feeling of hope, because some days, ooh, the strength is not there. Like, and I always say on those days, I draw strength from knowing I'm not in this fight alone. And I have the four of you and so many of my other wonderful friends and connections on LinkedIn and people who are, if I need to take a break, I know there are still people in the in the fight for us, you know, who are working to move us forward. And so I just really want to thank each of you just for your vulnerability and, and for your passion and for really sharing about yourselves. Because I, I think that there's strength in vulnerability. And the more that people realize that, I think the, the more that people can bond and the more we can understand one another, one another and keep working towards something that's really meaningful for all of us. Because I always think, I mean, think about it. Not one of us in this group would be the kind of person who wants to be okay if the next person isn't okay. So we're all people who, as I like to say, see the world past the tip of our own noses. So we think about how it is for the people around us, you know? So I just think that's so important. So thank you all for sharing just such beautiful, beautiful stories. I'm, I'm just inspired by the four of you. Anytime we're together, I'm like, oh, this is such an inspiring group of people. Like, it's just so nice to be surrounded by that. So now that we have gone through all of that, I'm just going to share a little bit and I'll say a couple of things and then anyone else who wants to jump in, please jump in um, when we think about the purpose for this group. And it's really so that we continue educating ourselves and we continue sharing what we're learning with others. Something that is really important to me, and I know it matters to the four of you as well, is being able to speak from a place of education and not just from a place of, well, you know, I had a feeling. Sometimes it's a lived experience and that's an education in and of itself because, whoo, the black tax, don't even get me started. You think you get more education and it's going to make you a bigger asset. And whoo, let me tell you, it just seemed to make me a bigger threat. Who knew? But it's one of those things um, where we're all just learning. I love Crystal. We're all so busy learning all the time. And we really just wanted to come up with a way to share that with other people. Because it's like if we can inspire each other the way that we do and keep each other going forward, like if we can give even just a modicum of that to, to even one person, like that would just, to me, it would be like world changing. Because if you change one person's world, that's still change. You know, even if it's just like you were talking about earlier, Greta, just that door opening just a little bit. You know, just a little bit, just that little bit of promise, that little bit of hope, um, that little bit of additional information. So we really look forward to sharing stories because when you're doing this work and you're not part of, say, a Fortune 500 company where you have a lot of budget behind you or something along those lines, what does this work look like for those of us who don't have some high level of recognition because we work for, you know, some specific company, but those of us who are really, you know, filling in a lot of those gaps and our stories don't get heard as, as, as often. And so I love that we get to come into this environment, share our stories, educate each other, educate the audience and anyone who cares to listen and just keep moving this conversation forward. So does anyone have anybody have anything that they'd like to add about our group's purpose? I wanted to add something that I did not mention earlier. I wanted to say how lucky and blessed that I am that I have run across each one of you. I just have always wanted to do a podcast, have always wanted to have a forum. <laughs> and I just never really knew 
in which format I wanted to do it. But I, I can honestly say that this has just been such a tremendous pleasure for me. And I wanted to thank you, the, each and every one of you for um, just the conversations. I'll just put it that way. Just the conversations. The conversations have been amazing, whether it's, you know, ideas on how I can shift my career into a DEI realm or, you know, whatever the case may be. I just want to thank each one of you. Um, for everything and your expertise. You're, this group is amazing, truly amazing. I Love totally that. agree. Um, and then in terms of like purpose, something that really speaks to me, I think also because uh, there are so many memes and relatable things on the internet these days, is that so many things in DEI, especially as a department of one myself, feel so lonely sometimes. But there are so many moments where I'm like, am I the only one? And it turns out never am I the only one, even if I'm the only one on my personal team. Like there are so many things that feel isolating where it's like, this is insurmountable. And then I come to this group where I talk to, you know, my, the broader DEI community. And it turns out I'm not the only one. And some of these obstacles, while they are hard to get past, there are so many different avenues to take. And I think it's really important to facilitate a space where it's not just me, myself, and I trying to find my way out of a dark space and having other people to, you know, bounce ideas off of and other people who are on the other side of that dark space and who have found their way out of it. And so I think that that is kind of a part of my purpose for being here is like, helping other people see that light, but also like being in a space where other people are helping me see the light that I'm not able to view yet. Um, yeah, so we'll give it back to Tanasha unless someone else has something to say, but that's a little bit about my purpose here as well, not being alone. I'm really looking forward to having other people from the community interact with us because, you know, this was is designed to be a safe space for um practitioners to come and share their stories or to, you know, even get advice on those things that they may be dealing with as a, as a department of one. Um, so I'm really, really looking forward to, you know, us, you know, kind of fostering a safe space for those who are doing this such important work to come and, and kind of decompress or bounce ideas off of. I'm looking forward to that. I love that, Crystal. And, and too, I think, you know, from our conversations, it keep in the back of my head, I'm always like, eh, nobody needs to hear my voice. There's all these really big, important people that are doing very big, important things in the world, and we get to hear from them. And our conversations just, you know, are such an important reminder that there are so many people at all different places in their journeys at all different places in their journeys. And this is such a cool opportunity, right? To do exactly what you said, to let people know that they're not alone, that you don't have to be the person that's making, you know, the boo-goo bucks at the, you know, Fortune 50 company in order to have a voice in this work. This work is huge, right? There's so much to this work. We need each other in this work because no one of us can do all of the things no one of us can know all of the things it's so big and it's and it's so constantly changing these these conversations are just such an awesome opportunity i think they have been for me and i again like you guys said i'm just that's why i'm so grateful um, and so looking forward to the opportunity to share and to hear you know from other folks as well um you know, what we're learning along the way um, and just being able to kind of share the ride too. So thank you all. I, I'm just very excited to be here with all of you. Thank you, Greta. That was so beautiful. I'm like, every time one of you starts speaking, I'm just like, even when I'm hearing stuff we've already talked about, like just the five of us, um, I just love hearing when each of you are speaking. I'm like, yeah, it's like, I know some of this stuff, but it's still like it's new. It's the first time. Did you have anything that you wanted to add, Courtney, about purpose? So I think I this is a really good segue. Um, we received an audience uh, question. So uh, Eric T said, can each of you give us a unique take that we listeners can get from your podcast? And I think my take kind of like the collective group mentioned, we're here to really be supporters. 
We're here to be supporters. We're here to be a safe space for people to come to. It can be really intimidating, like Greta mentioned, to speak with someone where there's so much space between you or you have to pay to, to be in the space with them. Um, but this space, it's like, we're right here with you. We're on the ground floor with you. We're working, we're doing the work. We are the worker bees right alongside you. So anyone who is interested in moving this work forward, whether you have a title and DEI or whether you don't, because sometimes those people are moving things forward. Um, I know I don't have a specific DEI title, but in human resources, I am moving the work forward, even though it might it might look different than, let's say, Tanasha or Greta as DEI consultants, right? So I think that's also something to keep in mind. And with all of our different viewpoints, all of our different industries that we do influence, everyone can be here on our podcast and find different ways where they can influence in their own communities and their own organizations. So for me, that's really what I believe our listeners can receive um, from joining us um, on a monthly basis. Love that, Courtney. Love it. Thank you so much. And that's such a great question, Eric. Um, is there anyone who would like to take their answer next for Eric's question? I'd like to. Um, in terms of a takeaway that I think I can offer, that we can offer as a group, um, is some of the what not to do in DEI. I feel like we've gotten a lot of what to do and lots of different articles and thought pieces about the things that you could do in an ideal world where you have endless resources, people, and budget to do different things. But there are also a lot of ways that I have had to reroute on my journey thinking that I was doing this pie in the sky DEI when there are many hurdles along the way based on business changes or based on things that are just happening in the organization. And so I think a takeaway that you'll get is some of like the, the not necessarily do's and don'ts because there's so much nuances, but like ways to avoid some pitfalls that I have dived right into thinking they were a good idea. I think it's important to have some of the, um, some of our learning moments that were not necessarily negative, but we're not as successful. Learning from failures and learning from missteps is really important. And so I think we'll get some of those takeaways. While it doesn't sound great, I think it's important to learn from that type of thing as well. Mm -hmm. Amen to that. Because one of the things that any of us who are doing DEI work, one thing we will all know is that this is not a success only journey. And so what do you do when you are trying to do work that is transformative, but you are in an organization that is more concerned with checking boxes? What do you do? Like we will get into that because I know we've all seen things like that. And just really having those open and honest conversations, like we're giving you our opinions, our takeaways, the things that we've learned. And just like Leandro was saying, it's not, it's not always pretty. Sometimes it gets, it gets real, real messy. So does anyone have anything uh, else that they'd like to add for Eric's question? Yeah, I definitely would add that I would say that we would have like unique perspectives that we can add to the equation. You know, it, there may be an issue or a problem that you may be facing at your organization in your mind and you're trying to piece it apart. There's a lot of value in having conversations about that issue um, just from exposing the different angles that may be present to thinking about something from, you know, thinking about something that's like outside of the box, that's a viable solution. Um, I find a lot of times when I'm faced with problem solving, for me personally, a lot, there's a lot of value in talking it through. Just talking, just the act of talking it through, it would like sometimes breadcrumb you to the answer. So I definitely um, am excited to see that that actually unfold in this group and, and, and during the conversations that we have, us talking about an issue and then potentially throwing out suggestions that could lead to uh, solutions. Yes, mm -hmm. definitely. Thank you, Crystal. Now, I know we're coming up on about an hour here, so we've got about a minute left um, before we do our wrap up. Is there anyone else in the group who would like to add anything? 
All right. Okay. I want to make sure I give everybody the opportunity. Now for our December episode, um, we are going to get more into navigating the current state of DEI. Uh, one thing we all know as practitioners is that there has definitely been a push to say that this work is no longer needed. And, you know, I'm of the opinion, if you belong to any marginalized groups, you should be involved in that conversation and saying whether that work is still needed or not, not having someone tell you that you have what you need. It should be asking you, do you have what you need? Um, so as we get ready to draw the curtains on this first episode of DEI Unmasked, whoo, can't believe we made it through. My social anxiety and my OCD said, whoo, we did it. We really want to extend our deepest gratitude to each of you who joined us to get today. Please know that together we're really going to unmask our personal stories. We're, we talked about our whys. We're going to talk about the future of this work. And the important thing to remember is that our diverse voices together impact our collective communities. So as we move forward, we invite each of you to stay engaged. Your thoughts questions and suggestions are really going to be the compass that guides the direction of this podcast. Unmasking is a journey. And so with each episode, it's going to take us a step closer to a more inclusive and understanding world. So remember, the conversation doesn't end here. Keep unmasking, keep engaging, and let's continue shaping a, a future where diversity is celebrated, equity is the norm, and inclusion is second nature. Thank you all so much for unmasking with us. Until next time, stay curious, stay open, and keep unmasking the world around you. Have a great evening, everyone.